Hi, everybody. I'm Dave. And I'm John. And this is Coffee and Capes, our podcast about two of our most favorite things, talking about coffee and talking about geek culture. Yes. And this is episode 31. After our faux pas, I figured it was important to announce the right episode number. We start forward. getting that right. Well, <laughs> as we have said, counting was is not our strong suit. Right. Yeah. That's all right, though. So welcome, everybody. We're glad you found us in whatever manner you have. Um, we'd like to remind everybody at the start here, all the different ways that you can connect with us. Yeah. So if you're watching us, we're on YouTube or the videos are embedded Hi. in the website, which is coffee, the letter N, the word capes at, um, sorry, dot com, coffeeandcapes.com. I had a little moment. And um you can find us there. You can send us emails, supers at coffeeandcapes.com. Listening to us on Spotify, iTunes, Stitcher, Google Podcast. The list goes on and on and on. So thank you for listening. We really appreciate it. Um, really and then, uh, of course, we're all over the socials. So Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, et cetera, et cetera. But again, just to be clear, we're not on TikTok because uh, the determination was we don't understand it we fear tiktok <laughs> yeah it's a little it's a little it's, it's a little intimidating yeah. for old people like us <clears throat> yes so dave what are you drinking today bud? i am uh enjoying very much enjoying some espresso in my uh ah. coffee case mug here yes nice uh espresso would you like to tell everybody about espresso is it a dark is it a light it is a dark roast i i i have failed in my duties here i have not called it right up to have all of the pertinent info but it is a dark roast um uh, most of the folks that i've talked to that have purchased it it's it's one of their it's their favorites Uh, i've got a friend who martin who's already like nope this is the one i want like so so good um it is tasty uh, and it's you know, I'm sure there are some um, purists out there who like are really, really mad at us for that name. <laughs> probably. I mean, but you know, we we named it nerdy because that's right. what exactly. we are. Exactly. If you look, it's a big X. We yeah. know that the word is espresso, not expresso, but it's right. punny. I'd like to think because it's the X-Men. Yeah, it is punny. It is for sure punny. Yeah, it's punny. Yeah. Um, and just so you guys know a little bit about it, it comes from uh, Central and South America, Africa, and Island Oceania regions. It is a dark roast. It's actually uh, one of the darkest roasts we offer. And then um, it is fair trade certified. So we always try to source out uh, fair trade and sustainable farming coffees. Yep. You know, so not only are we looking for quality, right? We're we're looking to make sure that they're kind on the environment that they're focused on uh, sustainability as well so taking care of the farmers that are growing those beans yep absolutely i am drinking critical role which is a medium roast and has some really nice tasting notes of like milk chocolate some honey to it which is a a nice little bit of sweetness and a, a slight hit of interest it's really good and this one is a single origin from Thailand. Um, so, you know, kind of a cool, cool place. Interesting story about this one. So uh, our roaster, when they went to Thailand, uh, visited this particular uh, farm and was checking it out and fell so in love with the beans and the process and everything else that they actually purchased this and then immediately implemented uh, like living wages for everybody that worked there and works the the fields so you know not only is it a great tasting coffee i mean it's really phenomenal but it's a really great story too so we love um, that story and yeah and you know we talk a lot here about uh community being one of our values and and that's one of the ways that we try to to live that out that um it's one of the reasons we were partnering with that particular roaster because they're committed to to those same values so we're yeah. We're grateful for that. Um, all right. So next, I guess we're moving on to fan fiction. Yes. Okay. Um, 
So fan fiction this week comes from a post we put up uh, uh, just a few days ago about the next Moon Knight episode that came out. Have you watched the most recent one yet, Dave? I did. Yeah, we did. Yeah, Josh and I watched it last night. Such a good show. It is becoming more and more trippy with every episode. Yeah. Uh, so Rachel and I were talking about it. And, and um, you know, one of the things that I, I really like about it is that they're not shying away from mental illness. Yeah. Right. And that they're showing that even with mental illness, you have the ability to be a superhero. Um, yeah. And they're so. not making a joke out of it. They're not just like, no, exploit. I don't think. I mean, as a one mm -mm. who is not experienced mental illness, I can't say definitively, but um, it feels to me like it's not exploitative about it. It's, right. it's presenting it as a uh, straightforward as as much as a straight as much as it can be straightforward yeah. in that format. I, I would agree with you. Um, and man, Oscar Isaac does a great job. Like yes. flipping back and forth between the different personalities. This week's episode had some real like emotional heartbreak and intensity yes. to it. Oh. Like, oh man. Um, we don't want to get too deep oh, in those weeds because I'm sure we'll have a, uh, a Moon Knight review podcast, after. a full episode once the, uh, the full series is out, which should be just yeah. in another week or so. So yeah, I believe next week might be the last episode. I think so. So true believers, you can look for, look for that in the next uh, couple of weeks anyway. Yeah. Um, so this one comes from Instagram and it's from uh, one of our followers, that endurance guy. Hmm. And he said, Oscar Isaac's performances are giving me the chills. He's so incredible. I hope he wins a bunch of awards for this because damn, does he deserve all of the awards? I never read Moon Knight. So going into this series completely blind, but absolutely loving it. Can't wait for the finale next week. Yeah, I got to agree. Um, you know, while I have read Moon Knight in the past, uh, you know, still going into this, I didn't really know what to expect and, right. and what direction they were going to take it and how it was going to end up feeling. And man, they just really knocked it out of the park. Um, and Oscar, I guess it's just, wow dude and ethan hawk and the whole the whole right. you know the whole cast uh really well cast well directed but yeah we'll go into it next week um in great detail i'm sure absolutely and, and i'm just happy now to know uh how i'm supposed um, to pronounce conchu yes that's really nice to know it was really good to know yeah yeah uh, uh that endurance guy thank you so much for uh for the comment we appreciate you and uh we agree yeah we can't wait can't wait for that final yeah um well dave what's our topic this week we have a topic this week i mean we kind of do i think oh yeah we, yeah we do yeah. so we want to talk about uh comic storylines that hooked us mm -hmm. do i have yeah. that right especially yeah i think that's a, i think that's a a good way to put it right yeah. so we're talking about like the storylines that when we were younger and have continued on to just maybe grab us and pull us back in um and some of these are you know runs and some of them are crossovers and you know what have you and and there's definitely been some as time has gone on where i've been like whoa i can't believe like this is so good and the impact that it had on like the marvel universe but <clears throat> we've both been you know comic book fans for forever and it's what we started in terms of talking about i know we talk about movies a lot and, mm -hmm. and cast but that's i think that stems from like the excitement of seeing our childhood heroes on screen absolutely and, yeah. and brought to life by people like chris helmsworth um you know so it's we talk about that often but none of this happens without those characters and the endless mythology that they have created and i and i you know i truly believe that this is like modern mythology yeah absolutely and it's to for me and i think for you too john that it's the comics that we read decades ago that form the base of our interest in in mm -hmm. geek culture now and yeah you're right we talk a lot about the movies and the tv shows and all those things um that are just so exciting because as you said oh my gosh this these characters we've been reading about for decades are 
brought to life and we get to see them in, in new mediums and that's medias and that's so great like I, but for me at least it's it's it always comes back to that that base of 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 the comics and not that i've read everything by any stretch of the imagination um nor am I familiar with everything or even every storyline as we're going to see here, but um, it's the, it's that early interest when I, for sure, when I was in my teens that yeah. uh, really started intentionally collecting each month that, um, that has formed, uh, I think formed my love for these stories. Yeah. Yeah. I, I same here. You know, I, I, I remember, and I've talked about this before, like washing my dad's car and doing chores around the house to get money to be able to go to the comic book store and, you know, really diving into the art and the stories. And, uh, you know, there was new stuff coming out at the time as well. And the first, you know, the first exposure I had to comic books was through my grandmother, you know, walking through a grocery store and there was the big spinny rack right. of yeah. comic books. Right. You don't really see those anymore. No. And she was like, Hey, if you're good, like you can pick out a couple. I was like, what are those things? And wow. then, you know, you open them up and there's, there's Spider-Man and there's, you know, Black Panther and the X-Men and everybody else. And you're like, what? They all have crazy superpowers. And this is amazing. And I remember the first X-Men comic that I ever read. Iceman was still a snowball. Hmm. Wow. Right. It's still just a snow. And it was weird. Yeah. And you're like, that's weird, but <laughs> it's cool. Right. Um, you know, beast was not blue. Right. Right. Um, so it, you know, that's, that stuff like stuck with me. And then as time went on and, you know, I discovered they had comic book stores that I could go into and just endless rows of stuff. I was like, what, what is this craziness? Yeah. I, I don't really, I never really went into comic book stores. If there were some around where I was growing up in Davenport, Iowa, I wasn't aware of them. Um, but these are back in the days I would have them where you could, you could buy them, like you said, at the supermarket or sometimes a convenience store. Like I would go down to the convenience store down. just down. Yeah. Ours was, I think not a Seven Eleven or something else, but still like same idea. They had a news rack and the news racks often had some comics and, uh, and I would, I would get some and, uh, these are back in the days when there were like pages of ads in the comics or they had a they had a page where you could cut it out. Imagine somebody cutting out from their, their wow. books these days and cut it out and send away to get a subscription. And so that's what I did. Yeah, I never did. I never did the cut out and send away for a subscription um, because I just ride my bike down to once, you know, when I didn't have access to the comic book store anymore. I would ride my bike to like 7-Eleven and 7-Eleven had like rack, they had the magazine rack and then the bottom of the magazine rack were all the comic books. And I would just mm -hmm. sit there and go through like all the comic books and figure out which ones I was going to take home and which ones I didn't. And uh, I just found out that there were bags that you could put a comic book in a Mylar bag or a plastic bag and, you know, keep it all nice looking. And, um, but yeah, it, convenience stores had them now if you can get those that some of those issues in newsstand holy geez like the rarity of being able to find something that was on a newsstand is just crazy yeah, yeah. and i never cared about collect i never cared about keeping them in any sort of condition i just want to read them and i read them over and over and over again we'd go on road trips and I'd bring a huge box of comics and I would just sit in the back and I would read comics and folks would say, Hey, get your nose out of that book and look at whatever this thing is that we're passing by. And I'd be like, Oh yeah, that's interesting. Can I, can I read this more now again, please? Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I think the only reason I ever found like the, the bags for them was I, I came across them in a comic store and I just wanted to, and I read all my comics. I read them all. Um, but then somebody told me like, Hey, if you put them in these bags, like they'll stay nicer longer. And I'm yeah. like, Oh, cool. You know, but I went through that whole thing. of like, well, I'll just roll it up and jam it in my back pocket yeah, and take absolutely. it with me and read it wherever I end up. Right. Right. Um, and this was, uh, you know, when we were teens and some of the storylines we'll talk about that happened during that time frame, like 
comics were also going through kind of a weird, like tough phase. Um, interest was waning a little bit. Yeah. You know, and it continued to wane. Like you still, I think Batman was always popular. Uh, Superman kind of hit her miss. X-Men became really big. And, you know, those were kind of your main drivers for a lot. Sure. Spider-Man. But overall, like it was rare that you got something new and exciting um, that really impacted the industry and equally rare that, you know, you saw these things just like take off on the level that they do now. Right. Right. Um, And if there were like 37 variant covers for every issue back in the day, I wasn't aware of them. (laughs) Right. Yeah. Yeah. That that was not a thing. I don't remember that being a thing. It could have been a thing and I just didn't know, but I remember the first Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, like really being, okay. a, yeah, being in a comic book shop and seeing that. I was like, what's that? And they're like, it's Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. You should check it out. And it was all black and white. I was like, oh, I have seen some of those somewhere. Like the, the, like the early ones were black and white. Yeah. And, you know, that version of me was like, eh, it's black and white. Sure. Yeah. Right. You know? I was like, well, you couldn't figure out how to color it in. <laughs> now I look at them like, ah, oh, so good. So good. And spawned so much stuff. Um, but, let, you know, let's dive into some of those storylines. Yeah, let's so, start with what you've got behind you. All right. So this is, uh, I guess in some ways, this is kind of an easy pick. But um, one of the most memorable storylines for me, I was, uh, I, as I said a minute ago, I would, I would subscribe and I had... I had four books. I would get Captain America and Avengers. And then when it came along West Coast Avengers and then Thor, Thor is my other one. And now at this time in my life, like I was, I was a bigger Cap fan than, uh, than Thor, mm. but this story, there was a storyline and it's, uh, was it Walt Simonson Simonson. That was the, uh, the writer for this. And it was a, it was a pretty long story, but for whatever it ended up, Thor has to go to hell to rescue some souls that were there unjustly. They weren't supposed to be, they were being kept, cap- they're held captive or something. And he's got a journey to hell. And he's had some, at this point in the story, um, like he's been injured in a few ways. And like, he's kind of, he's not himself. And he's starting to grow a beard to cover up some scars that he's received. And I might have the timeline a little bit off like that. Maybe that happens after this part, but, but, there's this huge last stand they have to make to when they're escaping from hell and uh and scourge who you see on the screen there uh also known as the executioner comes along he's you know he's got this had this long up and down rocky history of relationship with um the enchantress with amora and she had recently done something to, to like dump him or like say, you know, I never really loved you or something like that. And so he's pretty down. He's like, I need, I need to do this with you, Thor. And so Thor has him come along. And previously he'd been kind of an, kind of a bad guy, uh, or at least an antagonist. Um, and he comes along and, and as they're leaving, like there's sort of a, a, a 300 moment, right? Like the, the battle at, I've never know how to say that. Is it, thermopile thermopile thermo thermo i don't know how you say that for sure but that moment where like there's a a small a small opening and one guy can kind of just stand there and keep the hordes from coming from passing this bridge i think as they're trying to escape hell and scourge is like nope i'm doing it like thor was gonna be of course be the guy and scourge maybe even like hits him over the head from behind and sort of like forces him to not be the guy so scourge takes his place and he's and he's got his axe of course and but as you see on the screen, he's got he ends up with three machine guns and he's just mowing down the forces of hell. And it, um, you know, from the beginning, it's a lose, it's a losing gambit. Like he's not going to survive this. Um, and, you know, there's a moment in the in the movie Thor Ragnarok where Scourge has has a has has a similar kind of um, has a similar moment. Uh, at least where he's got the machine guns and he's kind of holding people off, but it, nowhere near the poignancy of the storyline in the book. And there's just something about, I, I, to me, this 
this book, um, Thor, and I, gosh, I'm not even sure which one it is, but you know, it's from the mid eighties. Uh, I should have looked that up to see which issue that actually is. Um, it's in the midst of kind of a long storyline, but that one is just the one you keep coming back to. And the way, the way it's drawn, like the final panels of Scourge, he just sort of fades out and you know, he's gone. He's made this, this ultimate sacrifice to save Thor and the, and the souls that need to be rescued. And, oh my gosh, it just, all these years later, it just really still stays with me. And you can see like Thor's got, you know, it was a time when he had to make use of his, his, uh, goats like i think that was some of the first times we'd seen the goats in the chariot um which are kind of traditional norse mythology things for thor but they hadn't shown up in the comics very much that i was aware of and so this was the time where we got to see the the goats and kind of in this corner you see some of the well there's thor bandaged up because he's because he's hurt um and that might be balder next to him there with the sword like with the the big horns or it might just be a, another warrior i'm not sure but it just was it was an epic battle with all sorts of forces and I was like oh my gosh this is what a what a tremendous story and it was emotional you know teenage dave was uh, emotional about it scourge just died like it, it really cemented my uh my interest in thor john you're on mute i just realized that rookie mistake a little, little, little thing just popped up and said you're on mute uh but it, you know and and then this guy translated kind of loosely right um but somewhat faithfully in, in its own way uh to thor ragnarok yeah right? so we we got to see this and you know going back to last week's episode right who wound up playing scourge carl urban carl he's urban like 150 yeah. other right. things too as we discovered yeah and and you know honestly like they like thor ragnarok had uh you know, probably made much lighter of the, the whole thing than, you know, the comics did for sure. Um, but, you know, great job by Carl Urban and, and Tika Waititi and everybody like kind of bringing an epic moment from the comics that had to, to your point, right. To your point, like some emotional impact. Yeah. It wasn't often, you know, we hadn't gotten yet by, by the time that came around a lot of the you know like characters dying right yeah um it was a big deal if a character died yeah right they they hadn't started the regular habit of dying and coming back yeah um oh we're gonna kill off this major character and then you know six months later you're like oh they're back um miraculously like revived but yeah it's such a man it's it's a good run it's a good run an iconic storyline and you know from a, a phenomenal book so nice choice dave this is a good one. yeah all right john how about you what's uh tell us about your background there yeah so you, if you're watching you can see my background and uh the the big one for me was was the mutant massacre crossover um and that crossover you know that's from 86 i was 14 at the time and i hadn't really experienced like a major crossover in comics something that touched like so many different books and you know you really had to kind of go from one to the next to the next to the next uh and as we were talking about before uh before we started you know this one involved the X-Men, X-Factor, New Mutants, Power Pack, Thor, and Daredevil, right? That is a crazy and mix. It is a crazy mix. But it was written by Chris Claremont, mm. who, mm -hmm. you know, it, it, if you know your comic book history, Chris Claremont was, it is often attributed with bringing the X-Men to a whole new level, right? In terms of his writing. Um and this was really kind of like a, a pinnacle moment of epic writing to go across all those different storylines. And I remember, you know, they were the Marauders. Like this was the first time we I come across the Marauders and you had these bad guys that, you know, were, were ruthless. 
Like we're truly, truly ruthless in going yeah. after the Morlocks down in the tunnels and killing these mutants. And then the X-Men go down into the tunnels and, you know, to, to help out. And we got to see some different and unexpected sides of some of these characters. I will never forget. There's a, there's a moment where, and I want to say his name was, was Riptide. He was one of the Marauders and his thing was like, he could spin so fast. It, it was a line in the comic that stuck with me for years and years, clearly. But he was talking about, he was talking to Colossus and saying, you know, he can spin fast enough to punch a piece of straw through the side of a barn. Mm. And mm. he's throwing shurikens out while he's spinning. He's like, I'm pretty sure I can puncture that metal hide of yours. Oh, wow. And so he, and so he's spinning and, and, you know, all these little mutants had been dying and Colossus, who I think we all kind of know to be written as like the gentle giant of the X-Men, like snaps and walks straight up to Riptide. He's, he's riddled with like these shuriken and throwing stars and he grabs Riptide by the neck and snaps his neck oh, man. In, the, in the tunnels. And just like, even now I'm like, I can feel the hair on my body, like standing up. Cause it was one of those moments. You're just like, Whoa, Holy geez. Like yeah. you just grabbed this guy and snapped his neck. And, um, you know, we got to see Wolverine in full hunt mode and just a different side of yeah, kind of everybody when faced with this, this enemy who who wasn't going to pull punches and to your point in the thor right that had an impact on me i was like hold on a second like this is a little bit darker than the you know superman flying around you know metropolis being like golly lois um <laughs> right you know and and i would i remember thinking so i want to see more of of this the more like realistic, like what happens when their backs against the wall and are they always the, we don't kill mentality of Superman and Batman. And clearly that was not the case. Yeah. Um, right. And so, yeah, it's just like it's such an amazing story. I probably read that entire crossover. I don't know. Like, a dozen times easily like those comics i don't have them anymore i don't know what happened to them but i guarantee you they were worn down yeah i i'm not i i have to admit i have not read that um what kind of role did daredevil and or thor play do you remember it's been a long time yeah it's been a long time like i i have to go back and you know i haven't read that since i was 15 16 and I'm much older than that now. <laughs> That's a, that was a couple of years ago. For yeah, us. It was a couple of years yeah. ago. And I've fallen on my head a few number <laughs> thousand times. Right. <laughs> so, um, but it's worth, it's worth going back and looking at, you know, kind of seeing how that all goes together because yeah, it tracks this whole thing through New York and Los Angeles. So that's where daredevil comes into play. Right. Is, is oh, okay. New York and hell's kitchen. Gotcha. That's really interesting. All right. Yeah. To but totally it. worth like, I, yeah, I'm going to check it out. Yeah. I think there's even a trade out there somewhere like a trade paperback. That's Probably. worth picking up. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that, that one will forever and going back and trying to recollect that run is unfortunately not a, an expensive venture. <laughs> hmm. I believe it. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, that's all right. Uh, and the artwork, so I got to I got to say this: I am not a big John Romita uh, art fan. It's not normally somebody. How I, dare you, sir? I know. <laughs> um, it, you know his stuff in like three hundred is good, and and because uh, it kind of fits. But yeah. and he did, you know, the Dark Knight. Um, but overall, I I don't know. It, it's something about it to me. But he has some iconic work in that storyline um that I, I didn't even care you know looking at it yeah of course it was some time after that we got like 
was it after that or during that? I don't remember when Jim Lee started his run on X-Men, but I feel like every time Jim Lee starts drawing for a comic, I'm just like, ooh, let's read that one. <laughs> <laughs> All right, my friend, what, what do you have that, uh, that impacted you? Well, so a little, a little lighter tone here. I'm going to say there's another one that came to mind and uh, around this, the same time um, when I looked it up and that the Thor that I was talking about was 362. That, that's uh, that Thor issue 362. And it was like mid eighties. Um, I'm not sure yeah. if it was 84, 85 or what, but it's about then. Um, around that same time, there was a storyline in the Avengers comic against I keep on, I always get them confused. It's not the Brotherhood of Evil Mutants, it's the Masters of Evil. And for okay. some reason, like the Avengers are gone and they attack the mansion. And this is the days when like the Avengers lived in somewhere out, like just like some random street in New York in a mansion. Mm -hmm. Yep, I remember. And they had like a, what do you call it? Uh, wrought iron fence around the mansion and that was their protection. <laughs> now, as he like, hopped over the fence and got closer and walked up the sidewalk stuff would pop up out of the ground and try to like stop them or whatever but as it does yeah right as it does. yeah exactly uh but this was a team of i'm looking it up now it was like um moonstar and tiger shark and shocker and some other dude i don't recognize and led by egghead <laughs> now, i don't know if there's a less intimidating villain out there than egghead but uh maybe kite man but it's less intimidating but I, love uh, kite man. I do love kite man as well but uh but as far as like mastermind well he was he was kind of like the leader light i guess he had a large head and was supposed to be super brilliant but somehow these guys got into avengers mansion and it was a um taken over and i don't know but it was one of those that like it was so wacky but also there's something about that oh my gosh they attacked the home like there's a vulnerability mm -hmm. here that mm -hmm. the that these that that our heroes have that had never thought of before and right. uh, you know i don't know that it's a super memorable storyline it looks like maybe it was in the 220s or so that that happened right, right. um but it just was one that I, I guess it is memorable because it, I, it has stayed with me in the sense that it was uh, clearly it couldn't have been the first like multiple issue story arc that I'd encountered, but it's one that I remember. And, and right, just yeah. that sense of, oh, I can't wait to see what happens next. How are they going to resolve this? What's going to happen? Um, and uh, who knows what the Avengers lineup I was at the time, because it was constantly changing in the in the mid 80s there like that. Um, True. Yeah. yeah, you know, it often had Cap, Thor, and Iron Man, but it didn't always. Like the those guys weren't always around for it, um, which made the team a little more vulnerable because they didn't have some of their heaviest hitters sometimes. But so I don't know. I just think it's kind of funny that you have a a kind of a weird character like Egghead and some minor villains, and yet they posed a real threat to the Avengers. So it was kind of interesting. I don't know. Yeah, I gotta be honest. I, like, I don't remember Egghead. Like, I the rest of them, right? Clearly, like yeah. Tiger Shark, all those guys. Yeah, okay, I I know those. I don't remember Egghead. So, somebody probably went, "Hey guys, we have this in the form of like the leader." Yeah, and Egghead is. Let's just kill him. <laughs> just kill him off. Yeah, we we'll just kill him off. Okay, that's fine. Yeah, he's a kid. All right. Um, yeah, I don't. I don't remember that one. But uh, maybe I'll try and go find it. And, and he was a big bald headed dude, like, and his head was shaped like an egg. Of course, and he was really was. smart, and he had you know glasses and and wore like a suit because or a shirt and tie because that's what was scary in 1980s. <clears throat> Five. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, the 1980s. Um, all right, I'm going to move on to one uh, 1988. Let's go till uh, 16. Um, for those of you that are good at math, by the way, you can figure out now how old we are because we just talked about 1988 and being 16. Dave, you would have been what, 17? In 88, yeah, I would have been 17. Yeah. Um, so this was like one of the first like 
anticipated like i knew it was coming and i mm. wanted to read it so bad and that was death in the family oh yeah right we had had a uh, second robin that nobody liked <laughs> right including uh, batman i think <laughs> yeah including batman uh the the geek community had been very vocal and if you ever read like the write in and tell us what you thought of this issue you know at the back of yeah, like some of those right, comics right it was very clear jason todd was not a fan favorite um <laughs> yeah and so it was the you know i remember it being in the news my dad was very supportive of like my comic book interest and talked to me about it he's like hey did you see in the news like they're gonna do a call-in to see if you know, this character lives or dies. And I was like, what? That's yeah. crazy. Right. And, you know, clearly he dies. Right. Uh, and that was huge. Right. He found out like in the comic, what the vote was. Um, but leading up to it, you know, you're just like, oh, what's going to happen? What's going to happen? What's going to happen? And then the way that it happened. Yeah. You know, with the Joker just beating Jason Todd within an inch of his life and then walking out of the room and blowing him up. Um, it was impactful in that. I think it was the first time and, you know, the Joker had done things with like poison everybody with Joker gas and, yeah. you know, whatever, but there was always like the, weird smile on people's faces and you know it still felt campy yeah right this was to me in the in the first time in my memory that i could think of that joker was off his hinge brutal yeah right like and and we started to see the level of like the kind of relationship that Joker envisioned he and Batman had because he hated Robin and that hate stemmed from a level of jealousy and that like, I'm going to leave a message, but at the end of the day, also, I want you to know, like I am his like, whatever. Um, and man, that was just, it was crazy. It was, it was a crazy storyline. And then the way that, you know, Batman eventually held himself back from killing Joker. Right. Right. Um, and didn't get pushed across that line. And then of, of course, you know, we know the ramifications as, as time went on, right. We've got Jason Todd came back as the red hood. Um, and, so there was a long-term impact that didn't happen until way later. Right. Well. It's interesting. To, sorry, go ahead. No, I was just saying, go ahead. Was, it's interesting how something that started off as a fan vote has become such a prominent story mm -hmm. and through line for so much of other DC storytelling. Yeah. Like at how many different versions have we, have we seen of, of this and how many times does it show up? Like, just off the top of my head. So I've been, I've been watching the Titans show on HBO max. Like that's the major storyline of, of season three is what's going on yeah, with Jason three. Todd. Uh, yeah. There's the, of course the, you know, the just glimpse in the Batman V Superman uh, movie of the empty Robin suit. Mm -hmm. uh, there's been rereading hush. Like that was, a, that was a major piece of that. Like the idea that he maybe would come back is is a is a is a, a major part of the story in Hush. Um, what else? I feel like I'm missing some things, but it just seems well, like it's coming up over and over and over again. Like, what's with Jason Todd? Right, and it's come up in other ways too, right? So you think about injustice. We've talked about injustice a lot, and it's brought up that you know when the Joker kills Lois. And uh, and their unborn baby, right? Uh, Lois and Clark's unborn baby. Yeah. And Clark kills the Joker. Like one of the big 
arguments that Damien brings forward, right, to, to Bruce is that you should have ended him so many times, right? And you never did, even after he killed, yeah, right? Like someone you're supposedly, that was supposedly your ward and, and that you cared about, even after he beat him to death, you still didn't. And look at all the consequential like deaths that have happened as a result of your inability to end his life. Right. Right. So it's, it's come up over and over and over sure. and over again. Absolutely. Right? And, and it has dramatically changed the Joker over the years within comics. Right. We think about how he uh, paralyzed Barbara Gordon. Mm -hmm. Right. We think about what he did with Jim in the killing joke. There's yeah. a, you know, he has evolved from, you know, I think it's easy to say in like the 1960s, like very campy, like even yeah. 1970s. Like, oh, look ah! at this. Look at this crazy caper we're on to like intense homicidal maniac. Yeah. Which completely and totally unpredictable and nobody wants to like no other villains even want to really deal with him. Like everybody's terrified of him because he just, you know, and he's and he's evolved away from it used to be everything was about the Joker gas, like, right, you know, yeah, put something in the water or let something into the air or do this. And now it seems to have gotten to a point where it's intimate and one on one. Yeah. Or put it in balloons. Yeah. Balloons. Somebody stole my balloons. Yeah. Why didn't anybody tell me you had one of those? Bob Gunn. Um. So yeah, it, you know, not only did it have did that did the death in the family have a, a significant impact on me, like reading comics at that yeah. time, and really renewed my interest in Batman specifically, um, but long term impact within uh, that universe as a whole has really been prominent. Yeah, it's a heck of a storyline. Yeah, what do you got, Dave? All right, I'm gonna go with a a uh, more recent one, a very recent one. So instead okay. of like reaching into the deep past, I'm going to go like, like current. And uh, I don't know if we'll be able to see, but the hmm, current run of Nightwing by Tom okay. Taylor. Uh, I have read some of that. So yeah. It's to me, it's fascinating because it's so the, the kind of the main story is, Nightwing comes, Nightwing becomes a billionaire. And I know on some level you're like, oh my gosh, how many different times in comics can somebody be a billionaire? Like, sure. yeah, right. what the heck, right? But he, he inherits a bunch of money and his big thing is what do I do with it? And of course he encounters some, you know, he's got, he encounters villains along the way and has to have some acrobatic fights and that part's great. Um, but you get to explore a bit of uh, Dick Grayson's relationship with Barbara Gordon and with, the other teen titans um or they're not teens anymore but the other titans um titans. right and what to do what is what is a responsible how does a responsible adult deal with having all this money like what can i do what he's like what can i do to truly make a difference with this money because he's determined that like i can't keep it that there's there's no such thing as a as an ethical billionaire like, I can't have all this money. It's not right. right. What do I do with it? How do I make a true impact and change my city? And, you know, I, that gets a little between like Daredevil and then uh, like all of the Arrowverse stuff on WD or on, on the DC TV stuff. Like, I think the whole my city thing gets a little, a little overused, but, but it's just like the art is tremendous. And I, I just think Dick Grayson is like this <laughs> has become surprisingly one of my favorite characters and i never really cared about him but i think he as nightwing has had some tremendously interesting storylines and this one really really grabs me and yeah I, i've said i think there's some similarities between it and uh and a current run of daredevil but but i just really i really like it and it makes me want to read that story now in a way that it it really never had before yeah um I've always been a Dick Grayson fan. I think we've talked about this. Like, like when I was a little kid, he was Robin, 
right and I thought, oh man if he can be a superhero i can be a superhero sure yeah right i just run around in my underwear with a towel tied right and clip neck. a towel to our neck and totally and whoever was right. whichever whichever friend you're with whoever was taller was batman and whoever was shorter was robin i was always robin i was always um, robin <laughs> yeah always the sure but you know it was the most it was the most relatable of like any superhero that i saw and um over the years i think it's been one of my favorite relationships that like Bruce Wayne has is Dick Grayson's evolution into Nightwing Mm -hmm. and you know how he's like the one that Bruce like really listens to outside of Alfred. Yeah. Maybe the only one. Yeah. Maybe the only one. Right. And also like, Dick's always had, despite coming up through like the, the dark aspect of like Batman, he has this like air about him. That's very reminiscent of like Peter Parker. Yeah, I agree. That's, that's a good comp. I think. Yeah. He's got this ability to overcome the tragedy in his life and still be a, a source of goodness and kindness. Yeah. Mm-hmm. In a way that, you know, I mean, yeah, he, he beats people up for a living. So is that really kind? But still somehow like his his personality has a almost a lightness to it that yeah. is kind of similar to, to Spider-Man. I think, you know, we've talked about how Spider-Man is jokey often out of an attempt to ameliorate his nervousness. And I don't right. think that's Nightwing at all. I think Nightwing's like very self-assured for the most part. Yeah, um, I would agree. Um, he knows who he is and who he wants to be in the world. And he's... Mm-hmm. And he's able to bring a, that sounds kind of lame, but bring a positive attitude to the world and how he approaches it all. As a contrast to Batman, who's always like, rawr, 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 rawr. like and especially, right. especially anything in the last really 20 years or maybe even the last 30 years, if we go back to the 90s of the, the Dark Knight or the, the animated adventures, right? Like it's all been dark and brooding and which is interesting right. and fun and good, but like Nightwing's a, an important counterbalance to that approach to the world. Sure. Yeah, I, I, I agree. And he's, and he's revered among like all the other heroes within that universe, you know, right. He is, he has just a sparkling like reputation. Everybody loves him because he brings that to the room, like that sense yeah. of just goodness that is, yes. you know, and including Superman. And there's a yeah. great scene in part of this run where Dick's trying to figure out what he should do. And he seeks out different people, advice from different people, including Superman mm-hmm. and Superman's like, Hey, we, we always look up to you. We, he's like, I look up to you. And Dick's like, what are you talking about? Like, how's that possible? But, but Superman essentially really says, does. yeah, because you're, you're, he doesn't say this, but as directly but something you're the you're the best of us your your kindness right. your goodness really shines through and uh and i want you as an example for my son superman says to to dick grayson like it's yeah. just tremendous yeah that's amazing um so good i'm mean, gonna have to get that trade now and and read that i've picked up a few issues here and there but yeah, yeah. I, nightwing is just amazing um yeah, and this one it's it's called leaping into the light, and it starts it collects. Let's see, I don't know, I can't find it quickly, but it's a good place to it's a good place to jump on for um, right. for Nightwing. Um, I like the the back cover. I don't know if you can be able to see this, but like you get the kind of the evolution of his costumes. Yeah, it's good. I'm <laughs> yeah, pretty good. Yeah, yeah including pretty some, awesome. Some pretty terrible '90s. Uh, <laughs> oh yeah, it was so bad. It was so, so bad. Um, all right, John, all right. You, got, you got another one for us? Yes. So I am, and there are some people who don't like this universe, but I loved the ultimate universe for Marvel. Okay. Um, but within there is a run called The Ultimate Enemy. And it's hmm. it's kind of a, like, towards the end, and, and there's an evolution of, so The Ultimate Fantastic Four is a really interesting read um i've I've probably reread that run and it's you know it's not huge because the ultimate universe didn't really last for a super long time but the ultimate fantastic four portrayed that group in a in kind of a different light 
And one of the things that was probably the most interesting is, you know, Reed never becomes the confident, uh, charming individual that he does outside of the ultimate universe. He tends to get locked up and spiral in these ideas. Um, you know, he thinks he, he knows better. He's still kind of messed up because everybody picked on him when he was younger. And then all of a sudden, you know, he's, he's got, you know, super, well, not all of a sudden, he always had this super intellect, but yeah, starts out showing him like being abused by his father and, you know, just a, a, a really tragic kind of experience. The ultimate enemy. So there's a point where Reed has essentially like sacrificed himself and died. I, and I don't remember exactly how it, how it goes, but he, he does it. And, but by this time he and Sue had broken up. She didn't really want anything to do with him because he was kind of a little weird. And, um, you know, Ben Grimm had turned his back a little bit on him as well because he couldn't fix Ben and, you know, yeah. Ben, Ben developed a grudge against him because he kept catching Reed doing all these other things, but fix him. And, mm, and really okay. that, that failed fantastic Four movie, I feel like stems from this run of fantastic four, um, which, which failed fantastic four movie, the most recent one. Okay. Uh, the most recent one, because there's a, there's a lot of like that similarity that exists there and you can see it and you're like, okay, yeah, I get it. But, um, all of a sudden, you know, all these, all these crazy attacks start happening from this alternate dimension and this, they're trying to figure out who this enemy is and who's doing all this. And it turns out it's Reed. Mm. Like he has survived and he's been in this alternate dimension building what he considers to be the perfect society and the perfect race. And he's, be, he's no longer known as Reed. Now he's become the maker. Yeah. And and he, doesn't Just, he always have like some sort of helmet thing on? Yeah, because his head is like expanded out to give himself like more space for his brain. And he no Again longer with has the leader to... slash egghead <laughs> idea. Right. <laughs> Leaning into that. But yeah. this is, I, I think, much more, you know, interesting yeah. in regards to, you know, now he's evolved. Like he figured out because of his body's chemistry and the way that it had changed, like he didn't need to eat. He doesn't need to breathe. He doesn't necessarily wow. have organs like anybody else does, but he's insane, right? He's, he's yeah. developed this idea. And one of my favorite things about it is Ben Grimm suddenly like the, cause they're all imbued with like the power cosmic, right? And Ben's been turned into the thing. Well, all of a sudden Ben gets sick, something happened and his his little rock scales start kind of falling off and this whole thing mm. and when and it turns out that it's like it's always been kind of a shell as he evolved underneath and when it falls away he's just this glowing like super strong amazing and he gets together with sue storm and it's just such a uh, you know the ultimate universe did a uh, very good job doing different takes on story on characters and teams that we had grown accustomed to. Like they did it yeah. with the Avengers and sure. making Bruce Banner, uh, Bruce Banner's Hulk horror, very much a monster. Right. Yeah. Very, yeah. Like, like straight out of horror comics. Yeah. Eating people. Yeah. Right. Like, he ate people. Yeah. I made cap into pretty much of a D bag. I didn't really like that much, that very much, but <laughs> he was, I, I think he was just more, I don't know in, in that. Yeah. There's some aspect to that, but I think he, he was more of that kind of battle hardened, like men, like very much soldier mentality. Yeah. Right. Um, more of, more of like, I've seen a lot, I've been through a lot and you know what, I'm just going to put my foot through you because that's <laughs> the way I deal with things. Yeah. Thor is kind of a Jesus sort of figure it's really i really think it's an interesting thing they did with with thor and like he can't he's trying to hear his father's voice and he kind of can't and he's is he sent to earth or is he just a crazy person like you're never really sure i think that's uh that's a to me a fascinating take on on how to how to explore that storyline yeah and you know it's really good it's a really good take on him and how it went down i mean and then we've got the wasp and ant-man right and hank pym ends up being an, an 
abusive alcoholic who beats Janet. And it's, it's so that whole universe had really uh, examines the flaws that mm, could exist yeah. within these heroes. Yeah. That's a good way right? to put it. They put the X-Men on reservations. Um, you mm. know, they kill a bunch of like the main ones. Yeah. Uh, and then there's the storyline of ultimatum, which is a, a short, like five issue series where Magneto reverses the, uh, the poles on the planet for a brief period of time and, and literally destroys massive chunks of the planet. Um, so it, it's it sounds about right. Yeah. Right. Um, but you know, out of all this, the ultimate enemy towards the end of the fantastic four ultimate fantastic four run is amazing. Um, I highly recommend it. it it's such a cool take on that. The whole ultimate universe, like go back and read it. Miles wasn't the only great thing that came out of that. Right. Although he made though he's up. he's at the top of the list. Yeah, he's he's at the top of the list. And that that storyline too, how we wound up with Miles and Peter sure, Parker. Died, right. Right. Like killing off Peter Parker. Oh man, that was brutal to read. Yes, for sure. Um, all right, Dave. We got time for one more. All right. I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go uh recent again, like something that has been out there for a few years, but I, I have just finally forced myself to pick up. Um, I should have brought it down here. I didn't. I have been binge reading Saga. Really? I have not yes. read that yet. I haven't picked it up. I heard yes. so many good things about it. Right? Like it's one of those that you always see it on the the rack for the like the top 50 graphic novels, uh, basically trade paperbacks, um, uh, versions of the of the stories, collected issues. It's incredible. It's just this tremendous story of um well, it's kind of a it's kind of a take, if you will, on on Romeo and Juliet, right? It's two 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 people that fall in love that have that are supposed to be bitter bitter enemies. Mm -hmm. They're not children, like in right, yeah, gotcha. In that, but um, but they're 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 both soldiers. Marco and Alana are soldiers in an opposing galactic war mm -hmm. that spans the universe, and yet they find each other in love and and they have a little girl and mm -hmm. the story is like how the universe reacts to this to the rumors that this exists right and it's a oh my gosh it's it's so compelling and the art is terrific and it's you know it's rated m for a reason it's mature content like right it's very like it's it's bloody and it's sexy and it's it's but it's so emotional and does such a tremendous job of, I keep using that word. I need to find, I need to find a thesaurus somewhere. Um, it, it just, <laughs> it just really, it explores all kinds of issues and especially about family. What does it mean to be family? Yeah, cool. And, and what you'll do for your family to survive and to, and to thrive and to make sure that do all you can to ensure that there is a future for your family. And dude, like I'm, I'm late to this party, but I am all on board for saga. Like, it's i have to check it so out good. i have to check it out because it's one of those that like uh you know adam um who listens to our podcast hey adam uh yeah. right has brought this up to me before and it's it's uh something adam really enjoys so i i'll have to check it out and grab it and before we before we come to a close because it just made me think right the family thing and something i'm a little bit late to the party too I don't think my daughter listens to the podcast, but uh, she's into comics as well. And she's the one who turned me on to something is killing the children. Oh man. Talk about good. Yeah. Like so good. And, and you recently got, got into it as well. And yeah, you know, we, we've had conversations. It is dark. Um, very it is horrifying at yes. times it's a like, it's a it horror is, comic it's not yeah, a, it's a, horror, it's a comic. horror comic which oh, i've not man. really done much with but yeah this one even just the name i think like kept me away yeah. from it for a while sure yeah but yeah once i started reading it i had no idea like really anything about it and then yeah um, it's it's literally my daughter delilah's like favorite comic book so i was like all right i'm gonna check it out 
see what it is. And man, so good. I just got the second part of the trade paperback. Um, so, you know, it, it's highly recommended apparently. And now there's house of slaughter, which is a, a Ooh, part of this okay. universe. Yeah. Um, I'm just starting to pick that up. So yeah, modern stuff can be just as good as some of these classics that we've talked about today. For sure. And the for saga, just to close the loop on that, like it, it got through 54 episodes issues and then took like a something like a three year break, but has just started up again. Like they're releasing new new issues just started here in 2022. Nice. Uh, so it's awesome. Yeah, it it's great to see. Well, again, I don't want to feel like I discovered it, but like I know that this has been out there and people have been championing, right. championing it for, for years. Um, I get it now. I get what all the hype is about. So sometimes yeah. maybe, that, maybe that's the lesson. Maybe that's the moral for today's episode, kids. <laughs> <laughs> like, sure. Try some new stuff. Like see what else is out there. Like go beyond just the, make yourself go beyond just the stuff that you, you usually read. Yeah. 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 There's Step some outside your comfort zone. Like look for some of yeah. those other things, like head over to the indie wall every now and then and, yes. and see what's out there. I mean, that's how I found God country, which ugh, man, so good, dude. So good. Um, all right. Cool. Well, I think that's, well, Hey friends, what, uh, what are you liking? What, what, uh, what storylines hooked you when you first got into comics or what storylines are you, are you really are keeping you hooked today? We want to hear from you. What are the, yeah. what are the things that you like? And, uh, you know, what are some stuff, what are some older stuff? Not that we missed because we weren't trying to be, there's no chance of being, uh, of hitting everything here, but just this right, is the yeah. stuff that was in our experience. So what's been yours? We'd love to hear from you about that in uh, all the various ways. Send us an email or find us on the socials. We love it when you, when you do that. And who knows, you too might end up on our fan fiction section. And wouldn't that just make your day? Totally possible. Totally possible. Totally make We're our not... day if you would do yeah. so. So there you go. hundred percent. Yep. Sweet. All right, everybody. Have a wonderful week. Uh, until next time, true believers. Bye. Bye, guys.